Good morning, Living Grace. It's great to see faces here that we haven't seen for a while. And good morning online if you're watching. Um, make sure to be filling out those connection cards. They're by your chairs or they're online that you can just click on and be able to fill that out. Um, and make sure if you have Facebook to share our service so other people can watch as well and um, learn about what we're studying. And last week we studied, it was um, Easter Sunday, and we studied about the prodigal son. And as I was reflecting this past week, um, well, first off, my favorite Bible verse is Psalm 51.10, and some of you may know this, uh, create in me a pure heart and renew my steadfast spirit. And as I was thinking about the prodigal son, as Pastor Jason was sharing it, I kept being reminded of that verse. And I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I can kind of relate. I related to the prodigal son when I wasn't a Christian back in high school. And when I became a Christian, I could see myself in the prodigal son where I was living the way I wanted to live. And then I was renewed. Fast forward, I think it's probably maybe 10 years now that I've been a Christian. Um, I realize that sometimes I can relate to the older son. I don't know if that's you as well. Sometimes I feel like when things don't go my way and I, I start questioning myself, well, I'm doing this and this and this for you, God. Why aren't you showing up and doing this? And I think that's kind of how the prodigal, or not the, the older son felt as well. And so as I was being reminded of creating me a pure heart, oh God, I realized that I need to continue to be created in, as a pure heart, because sometimes I not always have a pure heart, kind of like the older son, and it's important that the steadfast spirit in us, that we continue to ask for that. Um, so as we are just getting ready for this service and about um, do you love me and how we're going to learn what that truly looks like, I just want you to be thinking, and I'm going to lead in a prayer in just a little bit. Um, we are going to have some new faces up here. We have Hope Missionary Church and Emmanuel Church that are going to be leading us in worship, and Chris Kuntz, who is going to be um, doing the service for us. So as we are just preparing our hearts right now and creating a pure heart within us, God, we just want to focus on you. We just, we lift your name up to, uh, to you, God. We we want to serve you with our lives and not to just get things in return, God, but to do works for you because we love you. Because Not because we're going to get things in return, but because we want to serve you and what you did um, and sent your son, Jesus, on the cross for us, God. We thank you so much. We were reminded of that last week, God, but that's, that's why we're here. We're here to serve you. We're here to love you and to share the good news of your son's salvation for us, God. And we just, we love you, we thank you, and continue to create in us a pure heart and a steadfast spirit. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Living Grace. My name is Tyler. Um, I'm Chris Kuntz's son. Um, and like she said, we're representing Hope and Emmanuel this week. So, um, if you guys want to stand as we... Um, to celebrate and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. If my heart is overwhelmed and I cannot hear your voice, I'll hold on to what is true. Of all that you've done 
for another week, another opportunity to show you in our daily lives. And I thank you for all the blessings that you give to us that we don't even realize that you give to us, God. God, help us to have an open heart and an open mind as we go into this time of reevaluation. We can just do a heart check and see where we need to grow and how we can better impact the community and the lives around us just in our daily lives. God, we love you. In your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning. Living Grace, it's good to be here this morning. It was good to see a lot of familiar faces this morning as we, uh, as you entered in, and I know some of you are back for the first time uh, today, so it's good to see you, and uh, just excited to be here. If, again, if you don't know who I am, if you don't have a history with me, well, first of all, if you have a history with me, keep that to yourself. Don't spread those stories around anywhere. Uh, we've been, at, we've been uh, amongst this crew for a really long time, and, uh, and so I Good to see you guys, and if you don't know me, my name is Chris. Uh, do I am a worship pastor down in Bluffton, Hope Missionary Church, and uh, just excited that Jason asked us to be a part of today. Uh, I told him that we would give him a shout out, so I don't know if that camera is panned wide or not, but just everybody just turn around and wave at the camera and tell Jason hi. We're glad that uh, they are able to get away and go refresh and just get away for the weekend and for the weekend and just spend some time with family. Well, this morning, uh, I thought what we would do is, it's maybe a little bit of a departure from what you guys are used to. I know you've been going through uh, the stories of Jesus, you've been talking about the parables of Jesus, uh, the red letters, if you will, in the Bible. I love reading the red letters, I love looking at what Jesus specifically said, and how it correlates with life. There are actually some books out there where they've just taken the red letters and put those into book form, and so you can grab that book and just read what Jesus said, and I love to do that. Today we're going to look at another red letter, and it's more about what happened after Easter. As I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, I thought, you know, we're coming off of Easter, and that's a really big week, and I started evaluating what I do in my ministry, and how once Easter is over, we just kind of move on to that next thing. We're just going to get on, the holiday's over, now it's time to move on, start a new series, we're starting new ministries, what are we going to do next? And I slowed down, and I thought, I wonder what happened in the weeks after Easter? What happened with the disciples? What were they doing? What was Jesus doing? And so we're going to look today in a specific chapter in the book of John, chapter 21. But before we get there, I need to give you some context, because when you read the book of John, it's quite different than the other gospels that we see. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. They're titled that because they're similar story. They tell the same story from different viewpoints. But when you get to the book of John, it's quite different. If you will, um, if you will use the analogy of like a sculptor or a painter, that's what John is. You can take a snapshot, you can take a picture of something, and you can come back to it. And sometimes you will remember what you took that picture for, and sometimes you won't. That's kind of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're a snapshot of the general life of Christ from different viewpoints. But John takes it a little bit deeper. He says, I want to be more detailed. And so John is like a sculptor. He's like a painter where if you're going to sculpt something out of clay, you have to have your your materials, but you also have to have a subject. You have to have something that you're going to look at. And you're going to look at that subject, and you're going to grab the details of that subject, and then you're going to transform those and transfer them over to your clay. And you're going to keep looking back and forth. Every little detail is going to be moved back and forth between your subject and the material you're working with. Same thing with a painter. They're going to take the time to really try and capture what it is that they're looking at. That's John. As we look at this particular book, it can be a little bit confusing because John leads you all the way up to the 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 resurrection, and then he goes a little bit further as to what happens after the resurrection. In the, in the chapter 20 of John, we see that all the leading up to chapter 20, Jesus has been crucified, he's been buried, he's risen again. He's appeared to his disciples two other times and many other people before this. And then he closes out the book really nicely. If you look at chapter 20 in the last two verses, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open up because As I said, this is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to go with an old-fashioned Bible study. 
I know that every Sunday is a Bible study, but today is going to be just kind of old-fashioned Bible study. We're really going to dive into chapter 21. We're going to look at what the words mean, why they were said, why were they doing this, what's the significance of that. And I'm hoping that by the end of today, as you leave, you're going to have a little bit better understanding of this chapter. If you look at the last two verses in chapter 20, John wraps up his book pretty much like this. He said, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you will have life in his name. By the way, that's pretty much the theme of John, that you will believe in Jesus Christ, and by believing in him, you will have life in his name. He could have wrapped up the chapter just like that. That's a great way to end the book. If I wrote it all down, the world's books wouldn't be able to contain it. But then if you jumped over to chap, uh, chapter 1 of Acts, we have a problem. Because all of a sudden, Peter stands up among the believers as the leader and the guide for the next season of ministry. Why is that a problem? Because if you remember back in 20, where did we leave Peter? What's the last thing we read about Peter? He's denied Jesus Christ three times in the courtyard of the Romans. As Jesus is being led away, and he's being ready to go into his trial to be crucified. Peter's standing in the courtyard by a fire. He's warming himself. And a woman comes up and says, weren't you one of his followers? Weren't you with him? And he denies Jesus. And then it happens again, and he denies Jesus. And it happens again, and he denies Jesus. That's the last thing we read about Peter in the book of John. And then when you get to Acts, all of a sudden Peter's leading the church. And so we have to resolve that issue, and that's what John does for us in the book or in chapter 21. And, and maybe for a couple reasons. First of all, as we'll look through 21, Jesus loves to reconcile people. He loves to redeem people. That's why he came. Secondly, John and Peter were friends. They were in ministry together, and John doesn't want to leave Peter hanging as the bad guy in his book. And so as we go through this chapter 21, you're going to see how much Peter and John actually care for one another. So we're going to read through chapter 21. I'm going to break it up into four different sections. I'm going to give you four different principles that you can apply to your life as we walk through this. I'm just going to stick that up there for now, throw a little Greek at you this morning. But let me read through the first section, and that should be in your notes there in that first box. It says this, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. So he revealed himself again to his disciples. Again, this is the third time that, that Jesus has revealed himself to his disciples. Two times before this, we see in uh, John chapter 20, verses 19, it says the disciples were together behind locked doors, and all of a sudden Jesus appears to them. And then we see that again in chapter 26 of John. It says a week later, in the same house, Thomas is with them this time, and Jesus appears to them behind locked doors. So he reveals himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. Why the Sea of Tiberias, and where is that? That's in the upper region of Israel, in the upper area of Tiberias. It's the Sea of Galilee. We know it by that name. Uh, Gennesaret is another name we'll see in just a little bit. So he tells them, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 31, and again in 28, verses 10, we see it again in Mark 16, 7. He tells his disciples where he's going to be when he's met with them earlier. He says, I'm going to go ahead of you, and I'm going to go ahead of you, and I'm going to be in Tiberias. Meet me there. So this is why they are in this region. Verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two other of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going to go fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. And then they went out, they got into the boat, but at that night they caught nothing. A couple of things to look at here. We have seven of the 12 disciples gathered together at the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. They're waiting for Jesus. Jesus said, I will meet you on a mountain in Tiberias. And so they're hanging out in this region waiting for Jesus to show up. Don't know how long they've been there, but they had gone ahead because that's where Jesus said, I'm going to meet you. If you know anything about Peter, he doesn't like to wait around. He's a very zealous person. We've read about Peter in the past where when Jesus went into the garden and they're praying and the Judas brings the Romans 
and they go to arrest Jesus. Peter grabs a sword and he cuts off the ear of one of the, one of the servants there and Jesus heals them. Peter doesn't like to wait around. He's a very ambitious type of guy. And so he's sitting around and, and maybe Jesus, maybe he feels like Jesus is a no-show. We don't know. But he's sitting around and he's tired of waiting. And so he says, I'm going to go fishing. And what, what comes next indicates what type of person Peter is and how the other disciples view him even after his denial of Jesus. He says, I'm going to go fishing. And they said, we will go with you. That tells us that Peter is viewed as a natural leader. The others looked up to Peter. They could have said, okay, go. We're just going to wait here for Jesus because that's what he told us to do. But Peter said, I'm going fishing. And they said, we're going to go with you. I often wondered if this was um, a bad thing for them to do. I know there's lots, of, uh, there's lots of teachings out there that say the fact that they went fishing instead of continuing to wait for Jesus was a bad thing. It meant that they were tired of waiting on Jesus, and so they just went back to their old ways. Well, I think there's another way of looking at that. It's called passive waiting and active waiting. We can wait passively on the Lord, which means we wait and we do nothing. We're just sitting around waiting. Or can we can wait actively. And we can go about our work. We can go about the things that God has gifted us and the way that he's gifted us. We can continue to do what God has gifted us to do while we wait. And I'm, and I'm guessing that's what Peter did here. They were fishermen by trade. They were professional fishermen, and they still had to feed their families. They still had to eat. And so I'm guessing that Peter said, I'm going fishing. We can continue to look for Jesus, but I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go fishing. And the others follow. The scriptures tell us that they were fishing at night. That's not an uncommon thing in the Sea of Galilee. They would, well, they would go out at nighttime in their boats. They would put torches on the edge of the boat, and, and it's said that the fish were attracted by the light, and so they would fish at nighttime. It's possibly cooler. I've been to the Sea of Tiberias and Sea of Galilee. It can get warm out there in the summertime, and so if you can imagine being out on the water, and you're working, and you're throwing the nets, it could get pretty hot, and so they could go at nighttime, and they could catch these fish. Another reason for going at nighttime would be they catch their fish, and then in the morning, they have a fresh catch to take over to the market. And we'll see that play out in a minute. So they're fishing at night, they're working all night long, and they don't catch anything. Verse 4, Jesus, or just as the day was breaking, so it tells us they were, they were fishing all night long. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children... Do you have any fish? And they answered him, No. He said, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And so they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Now the sun's coming up. I had a picture for this, uh, but I took it out because I didn't know how it would translate uh, through the TV and online. But um, when we were in the Sea of Galilee in Israel, the sun comes up over the Golan uh, Golan Hills, the Golan Heights, and it shines across the, the waters, and it's just absolutely gorgeous, and I can just imagine what it looked like for the fishermen as they're out on the water, and the, and the sun comes up, and it's blaring on the water. They might not have seen Jesus. Scripture tells us they were about a hundred yards off of the shore. It's about how far away they were fishing, and so at a hundred yards, football field length, you, it's going to be hard to see somebody. You could see an outline, but you might not be able to see detail, plus the sun was in their eyes. So the sun's coming up, Jesus is standing there, they don't know who it is, and Jesus says to them, children, do you have any fish? And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't go around calling a bunch of fishermen who are probably rough and gruff, I wouldn't call them children. But the term for that is paideon, that's the Greek term, it means young ones, somebody that you would care for. And so in that context, Jesus is saying, my children, have you caught anything? Do you think Jesus knew the answer to that question when he asked it? I'm sure he did. And, and I love it when, when questions like that are asked. Like in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve have sinned and they're hiding from God because they heard him walking in the garden. And God yells out, Adam, where are you? He knew where he was. He was hiding behind the fig tree. He was hiding behind in the bushes. G Jesus knew they didn't catch anything. God knew where they were hiding. And I think those questions are asked not so much that God or Jesus don't know, but they want the person to know. Jesus is saying, did you catch anything? He knew the answer. He wanted them to realize they hadn't caught anything because of what comes next. They said, no, we didn't catch anything. Jesus says, well, just throw your, 
net on the other side. I don't know if you know how big the boats were in Jesus' day. They're about seven and a half feet wide, 24 feet long. If you ever go to Israel, there's one there that they dug up for the first, from the first century that you can see what a boat of Jesus' day looked like. Seven and a half feet wide. Jesus says, take your nets from this side of the boat and cast them on this side of the boat. Now, to a professional fisherman, that probably sounded really silly. Uh, schools of fish aren't tiny, tiny, tiny clumps. They're usually pretty large, and seven and a half feet really isn't going to make a difference. But they did it anyway, and that was wise on their part. So they cast the net, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The principle that we can learn from this particular passage is this. Work in the power of Jesus and in the flow of God and your results will be much better. Work in the power of Jesus and the flow of God and your results will be much better. They were professional fishermen. They had been out all night fishing and caught zero, nothing. Jesus was a no-show. They didn't catch any fish and that's their profession. They were having a great day. But then Jesus shows up and he says, throw your net over here. Obedience was the difference in their success. They'd done it all night on this side of the boat. And Jesus said, throw it over here. And when they did, they caught a net full. I remember when I was in Indonesia back in uh, 89, 90, I went to Indonesia for two months. And um, some of you actually supported me going on that trip. Uh, so you might not know this story. Um, but we lived in the jungle for about two months, living in tents. We were there helping um, the locals put in some fresh water pipes in their village. And so every morning we would get up. We were camping down by the river. We would get up. We would walk uphill about a mile over to the center of town. We would hang a left-hand turn, walk about a half mile down to where the job site was every single day. And so... About a month into this, a buddy of mine named Steve and I, we were getting ready to head back to our camp, which means we were going to walk about half a mile this way. We were going to turn right and walk half a, or a full mile this way down to the river. I don't remember if it was my idea or if it was Steve's idea, but one of us said, I really don't want to walk all the way down there and then walk all the way over there. Why don't we just cut through? Why don't we just do that? One of us said, that's a great idea. And so we started walking through the fields and then we got into some jungle and then we got into some more jungle and at one point I am not kidding you it looked like an Indiana Jones movie where I'm hacking vines and branches with my machete to get through where we were going I'm like we've gone this far we can't turn around and we can't go back stumbled across an ox tied up finally stumbled out onto a, a wooden a wooden uh, not a wooden path a dirt path and some um, natives were walking by carrying water on their head and I looked at them and I said river Where's the river? And they pointed us up and around the corner. Because I knew if I could get to the river, I would at least have my bearings straight. We camped on the river. I was pretty certain we were upstream. So we get to the river, and that was great, but there was a problem because there was a fork. Luckily, the water was all flowing this way. I knew we were upriver, so we're still good. I still kind of know where we're at. Steve and I crossed over the shallow part of the river. We went up on the other side, which is a pretty high hill, so that we could get a better vantage point of where we were. And as we're looking around, I could see familiar terrain about a half a mile down the river, three quarters of a mile down the river. And I told Steve, I said, I think our camp is down there. And so this was the point we had a critical decision to make. We could either, in our own power, try to go back the way we came, find the road, get on the road and do what we were supposed to do, or we could get in the river because we knew the river was going to go right past our camp. Ultimately, we decided to get in the river. This is where, when I tell my mom this story, she freaks out a little bit. And I do now, knowing what I know now, it was not a great idea. We get in the river. Uh, mind you, we're wearing eight-inch tall leather boots. We had to wear jeans. I'm carrying a shovel, and he's carrying a pickaxe, and the water is above our heads. And it's, and it's a jungle river, so it does this thing. You know, it goes around this corner, and then it goes around that corner. So we start floating down this river, I'm not a great swimmer. Steve is. He's like, come on, it's okay. We can do this. We'd get around one bin and we'd stop and we'd rest. And I'd look up, the next bin's got a couple uh, red baboons on the, on the shore. And I'm like, oh, dude, I don't know if this is a good idea. It's too late. We can't go back. We worked our way around through each bend. And then we got to the end 
of that, we got to the end of the bins and we had a, just this long section, probably two football fields long of just deep, stagnant water. It was moving, but it looked stagnant. The water had been carrying us up to this point. And we get to that point and I am just tired. I can't swim anymore. Luckily for us, there were some natives there that were gathering river rocks, putting them in inner tubes, floating them down to our campsite where they would pull them out, load them in a truck to build the roads. They threw us a couple inner tubes and from the last uh, 600 yards or so, we just floated. The flow of that river carried us to where we needed to go. I could not do any more in my own power. Needless to say, we got to camp, grounded for two weeks. We weren't allowed to leave camp rightly so. Uh, the story ended well. We came home in one piece. My point is, we could have in our own power gone back the way we came. You could see where that got us. We were lost. We were tired. We were struggling to get where we needed to go. But we chose to get in the flow and in the power of the river to get us where we needed to go. Our results were much better because we were in that power and not in our own power. And so the, the principle here is, Working in the power of God, working where Jesus is already working, working in the power of God, in the flow of God, our results will be much better. Moving on to verse 7. That, sight, that disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. That disciple whom Jesus loved. Who's that? Who's writing? It's John. Isn't that a humble way to say, oh, that disciple whom Jesus loved that's me I'm just saying that's me I love it when he does that he said to Peter it is the Lord how does he know this if you go back to Luke 5 and I believe I have it up here Luke chapter 5 this is when Jesus first calls his disciples this is when they first meet listen to this story it says, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, pressing in on Jesus, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Again, that's the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, that's Simon Peter, he asked him to put out a little while from the land, and he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep, let's go fishing. Let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will put down the nets. Wise decision. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their other partners to come in and the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled the, both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. So this is how John knows that it's Jesus. He's seen this happen before. He's like, wait a minute. There was another time when somebody told me to put my net over here after a night of fishing and we hadn't caught anything. There was another time, and that was Jesus. I'll bet this is Jesus too. And so he tells Peter, it is the Lord. And Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the nets full of fish, for they were not far from land about a hundred yards off. I don't know why Simon threw his outer coat on. He was probably, he had probably taken his outer robe off. He had a loincloth on. He's working, he's sweating. It would probably be restrictive. Why he threw it back on to swim over to the sea, we don't know. Uh, again, I'm not a great swimmer. That seems like an awful long way to swim, hundred yards. Um, I would not have made that, especially with an overcoat on. So he swims, he swims in, and when they get to the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although they were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said, come, have breakfast. And now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. 
Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had revealed to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. The last time we see a charcoal fire mentioned, again, in the Roman courtyards where Peter is standing there denying that Jesus is somebody that he followed. And this is where we begin to see this restoration process happen in Peter's life. Jesus invites them to bring part of their catch. This is an interesting thing. Jesus doesn't necessarily need their fish. He's already got fish laid out on the charcoal fire. Breakfast is ready. They show up. They're tired. They're cold. They're wet from a, a long night of fishing. Jesus has got this nice little fire, some bread, some fish. Sounds like a pretty good, uh, sounds like, I bet it was really good if Jesus cooked it. He says, bring some of the fish you've caught. 153 fish. I, I'm wondering why 153. Um, couple different thoughts. Um, first of all, we don't know why specifically, but a couple different things to think about. Jerome, who was, I believe, a fourth century preacher and theologian, said that at that time, there were about 153 known species of fish in the world. That's kind of cool. Uh, it could signify that Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men, and you're going to go to the utter ends of the earth for this catch. And here they've just caught almost every species of fish known to mankind. That's kind of cool. The other probability, and probably the most likely one, is they've been fishing all night. They catch fish, and they have to take it to the market. So somebody had to count. Um, I, heard one, I heard a pastor uh, talking about this one time, and, and he said, can you imagine... The disciples are there. Jesus is there. He said, come eat breakfast with me. And he's like, hold on. I, I need to count. One, two, three, four, five. Hold on, Jesus. I'm almost done. Six, seven, eight. I think it'd be kind of funny just to see. And I'm sure Jesus had a sense of humor there. Jesus says, come have breakfast. That's interesting in and of itself. That is an invitation to forgiveness. That is an invitation to reconciliation. We see this in Revelation Revelation 3.20, it says, Here I am, this is Jesus speaking, Here I am, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This is written in the, church, uh, in the letter to the church of Laodicea. If you remember, he, he um, accused them of being lukewarm. He's going to spit them out of their mouth because they weren't really truly following him. But here's this invitation of forgiveness. I will come in and eat with you if you open the door. I'm knocking. I'm here. You open the door, I'm going to come in, and I'm going to eat with you. So Jesus invites his disciples, Peter included, to come and sit down and have breakfast. It was a gesture of forgiveness. This has always confused me, the second part of verse 12. It says, Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Why was that written? Why is that even in there? Jesus has already revealed to his disciples two times before this. There's a thought here that we can, that we can work with. If you, if you take the idea of a seed, everybody's planted a seed at one point, I'm assuming. A seed is just this big. And you plant it, and you feed it, and you water it, and all of a sudden it grows up into something that looks completely different, right? A seed and the plant that it produces have the same DNA. They have the same connection, but they look completely different. There's this idea of the resurrected body. Keeping in mind, Jesus at this point has, has been killed, he's been buried, and he's been resurrected. He is now in his resurrected bodily form. The disciples are not. They're still in their earthly, fleshly form. And so there's this idea that, that it's Jesus but they, not, they might not be able to recognize him, but they recognize his actions. They recognize his words. So there's, there's this thought here that they knew it was the Lord, but they didn't want to ask. But they knew, but I'm not sure, but I know. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and so with the fish. Now this was the third time Jesus had revealed himself. The principle here is that Jesus invites us to join him in what he is already doing. You know that Jesus is always at work. God is always at work. He's never idle. He's always doing something. And our responsibility is to get in that flow, get in that path of what he's already doing. Join him in his work 
and the results are going to be so much greater. Huntington University, um, I don't know how long ago this was. I, I believe it was probably maybe 10, I could be off, 10, 15 years ago. Um, they were looking to put in some sidewalks. And this is at least the story how I heard it. They were looking to put in some sidewalks, and they had some sidewalk plans drawn up. But somebody said, let's wait. Let's see where the students walk as they go from class to class. Let's just see what, let's just see what happens. Well, eventually there was a path worn in the grass because the students would go from this door and go over to that, that building, or they would go over to this building. And so then they decided that's where we're going to put the sidewalks. Jesus invites us to join him in what he is already doing. Look for what God is doing around you. I don't know how many times I've been a part of a church where we said, we're going to go here. We're going to go here. We're going to go do that. We're going to go make disciples of men. We're going we're to go proclaim this word in the street. Those are all great things. But if God's not already working there, you're doing things in your own power. Be diligent. Look around. See what God is doing. He's working in the hearts of men and women around you. Be sensitive to that and look and see what he's doing and join him in that endeavor. Verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And then Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Do you think it's awkward that Jesus would have this conversation with Peter in front of all the other disciples, keeping in context of what Peter did? Peter stood and he denied Jesus three times. That is Peter's legacy at this point. That is what Peter is known for and remembered for. You're the guy that denied Jesus three times. After, after all those other claims that you made, you denied him three times. That's what he's known for. And then here Jesus is asking him in front of everybody, do you love me? Really? I think he's trying to address, uh, let's just call it the elephant on the shore, right? They're standing on the shore. There's this thing Everybody knows Peter's the guy that denied Jesus, and so Jesus is going to address it. Charles Spurgeon says, a man's repentance should be as notorious as his sin. What's that mean? There was uh, two, two, three years ago, maybe it was just two years ago now, um, some staff that I work with and myself, we went to um, Dallas, Texas, to a conference at this uh, church and a phenomenal conference and while we were there I think it was actually even the opening night we're sitting there senior pastors on stage and he's talking he's telling us this story about a guy who had uh, been a contractor in the church he had, was contracting for the church he was contracting for people in the church he was contracting for the senior pastor he had keys to all of their homes he had keys to the church come to find out that he'd been stealing stuff from homes. He had been stealing stuff from the church and he'd been selling it to fund whatever issue he had going on. Well, when that was found out, they obviously, and he was in leadership at the church too on some, on some boards, and so they removed him from leadership and uh, obviously he was no longer allowed in their homes. And so this big thing went down, right? And they basically removed him. They chastised him for what he did. But that night, as he's telling this story, I'm thinking, why is he telling us this story? This, airing this guy's dirty laundry in front of everybody. Why is he doing this? He gets to the end of the story, and he invites this guy up on stage, and he gives him a microphone, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, this is that man. And tonight, I am here to restore him into ministry. This is the first time in a year he has stood on the stage. This is the first time in a year that he's had a microphone in his hand. And we want to tell you the story and the hard work of heart work that he has done to get back to this point. So they told us all of his, all of his dirty laundry, but then they stood him on the stage and they confirmed in him and they, they gave him ministry again. And the applause that went up in this place 
to see the diligent work of restoring somebody back into ministry, restoring them back into right standing with everybody was amazing. It affected my heart. And that's what Jesus is doing there. He's like, you messed up, but I'm going to give you a chance to redeem yourself. We're going to tell everybody what you did, but I'm also going to fix it. And so that's what we see happen here. Now, Jesus asks him this three times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? It wasn't uncommon, it's still not uncommon to address somebody three different times on the same subject in that region. I've seen and I've heard that happen. Backing up to verse 15, he says, do you love me more than these? What do you think he was referring to? Any thoughts? Peter, do you love me more than these? I'm glad you're hesitant. We don't know. We don't really know what he's meaning. But there's a couple thoughts here. Do you love me more than the fishing tools that you use? You just went back fishing. This is your profession. This is what you know. Do you love me more than your old life, the things that you knew? Or it could mean, if you remember back in Matthew chapter 26, verse 33, Peter claims Jesus is, is he's in the upper room and he's telling his disciples, look, I'm going to die. And when the, when the shepherd is struck, when the shepherd is struck, all of his followers are going to split. They're going to just leave me. And Peter says, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. In essence, he's saying, even if all of these other disciples, all of these other brothers of mine leave you, I am never going to do that to you. And so Jesus says, do you love me more than these? He could be referring to the other disciples that were there. And Jesus says, uh, uh, Peter says, yes, I love you. And he says, feed my lambs. We, we already read through this. I want to show you something here. There is some wordplay going on with the word love. There's two different words being used here. If you read this through in English, it doesn't really make sense. Why does Jesus ask three times? Why does he give him three commissions? Feed my sheep, tend my lambs. Um, and then why does he get angrier or frustrated or sad on that third time through? Here, here's the reason why. Agapau, agapau, unconditional love. 100%, I am devoted 100%, unconditionally, doesn't matter what you do, I love you. That's the kind of love God has for us. And then you've got phileo love, which is a friend's love. It's a love between friends. It's an admiration. Okay, so with that in mind, let's see if I did this right here. Nope. Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you agapao me? Do you love me unconditionally? Peter says, Lord, you know that I phileo you. You know that I admire you. Feed my lambs. Jesus says to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you agapao me? Do you love me unconditionally? And Simon says, you know that I phileo you. You know that I love you as a friend. And then this is where it gets interesting. The third time through, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you phileo me? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. One more way of looking at this. Jesus says, John, do you love me 100%? Like you sold out for me? Eh, I'm about 70. Simon, do you love me 100%? I'm about 70. That's where I'm at. Simon, do you really love me at 70%? Yes, Lord, you know all things. I love you at 70%. But even at 70%, Jesus comes down to his level of love. Even at 70%, Jesus commissions him and restores him three times. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, take care of the things we're not talking about animals. We know this. He's talking about his people. Take care of the things I just died for. Take care of the things that are most precious to me. Even at 70%, you'll grow in that love. But even at 70%, take care of those things. He goes on, verse 18, he says, Truly, truly, 
I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself, you walked wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19, this he said to show by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. This is really cool. It's easy to read over, but it's really cool. Jesus says, when you were young, you used to go whatever you want to do. You used to dress yourself, but when you are old, somebody is going to lead you where you don't want to go with your hands stretched out. First thing to notice is Jesus just told Peter he's going to live a long life. When you are old, you will die. That is important because when we see Peter get arrested and he's in the cell between two guards chained together and they say, you're going to be beheaded in the morning, what does Scripture say? Scripture says Peter was sleeping peacefully between those two guards. How do you sleep the night before you're going to be beheaded? Because Jesus promised him, when you're old, somebody's going to stretch out your hands. That means you're going to be crucified. So he told him he's going to live a long life, and he told him how he was going to die. Wouldn't that bring peace if you knew, and hopefully it's old and not young, but if you were told you're going to live a long, long life, and you're going to die this way, for the rest of your life, you know, I'm not going to die till I get old, and, and uh, maybe, I de- maybe I develop a sickness, but this isn't how Jesus said I'm going to die, so I'm going to make it through this. So I'm peaceful. I'm okay with that. That's Peter, chained between the two guards. You're going to be beheaded in the morning. No, I'm not. Jesus said, I'm going to be crucified, and not till I'm old, I'm going to sleep. The principle here is real peace comes from the promises of God. When we listen to and function within the promises of God, we can have peace. We'll wrap up in this last section real here, and it won't take too long. Starting in verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. There's John again being humble. Peter turned and he saw the disciple John following them, the one who had also leaned back against him uh, during the supper. If you remember in the upper room, John leaned back against Jesus and asked who was going to betray him. When Peter saw him, uh, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? You just told me how I'm going to die, how long I'm going to live. Well, what about John? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. That's important. Don't worry about your brother, Jesus is saying. Worry about that which I have called you to. Don't get distracted. I'll take care of him. You follow me. Those were his words to Peter. Follow me. Now I would think that we would all agree as show of hands it's important to believe right it's important to believe in jesus okay that was you know about 20 percent of you but i know we all we all agree that it's important to believe in jesus it's more important to follow him because even the demons believe in jesus and they shudder but if we don't follow him our belief is just lip service as i was standing here this morning i was looking at the tv and this popped up this is your mission statement helping everyone take their next step in following Jesus. It could have said believing in Jesus, but that's a whole nother level. That's 100%. That's an agapao. Following Jesus is with deeds. It's with action. It means I'm going to do something with the belief that I have. James chapter 2, 18 through 20 says this, but someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. That's great. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? You skip down a few verses. He ends it like this by saying, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. We have to to believe, but we also have to follow. Because if we're not following, then we're just giving lip service to a guy that did some really great things. Following Christ 
is what sets us apart from everybody else. Wrapping up verses 23 through 25, it says, So the saying spread among the believers and among the brothers that this disciple was not going to die. But Jesus did not say that he was not going to die. He simply said, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? And then John wraps up by saying, This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, that we know that his testimony is true. There he is being humble again. Now there were many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. The principle here, true belief requires you to follow. Anyone in this room can say, I believe in Jesus Christ. And that's great. But if we're not following, if we're not actively working within the flow and power of God, and putting ourself aside and putting him first and loving him to the best of our ability at 100%, then we're just providing lip service to the king. And our results will be so much less. We'll get tired, we'll get frustrated, we'll get burnt out. But if we, if we function within that power of Jesus and we believe and follow, that makes all the difference in the world. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, uh, thank you for John. Thank you for his detailed account of your love, of how you desire to see people redeemed and how you desire to see people restored. Thank you for uh, taking time with Peter and restoring him into service. He was crucial in Acts as we read as the church grew. Thank you for loving us enough to take care of us, to seek after us, to call us to a deeper love than what we are oftentimes willing to give. God, may our love be a, 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 an agapao love and not a phileo love. Would you help us to love you unconditionally the way that you've loved us? Would you help us to seek out where it is that you're working in the lives of those around us and even in our own life so that we can join you in what you're already doing? God, I pray for living grace as they, as they work within your power to reach out to the community that is growing up around them, so critically situated. Father, may they look for your workings in this community and jump in 100% to help people see you, to help people know that, yet, yes, they're going to mess up, and yes, we have messed up, but you call us into this restoration process and you give us a ministry to be a part of. God, thank you for forgiveness. And thank you for your perfect life on this earth. God, as we sing this last song, would it be a prayer that we would set our heart and our lives firmly within your will, that we would take our hands off of it, that we would lift them in praise and adoration of who you are, and that it would become our life's mission, Father, to see your name glorified. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word and the truth of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing this last song?
upon the foundation of your word that we would build our, our, our lives upon the foundation of your love God as we leave today would you go before us would you help us to keep our eyes open to see where it is that you're working that every day when we wake up our first breath would be a prayer of thanksgiving and that we would continually seek your face Father we love you and we praise you for all that you've done all that you are doing and all that you will do in the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for welcoming us. We're glad to see you and glad that you were here. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.